All right, so we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, this is uh, without a doubt this is my least favorite this is my least favorite topic to talk about. Um, whenever I got into physical therapy, like uh, whenever I was making my application to, uh, to go to physical therapy school, like I kind of saw myself as doing more like sports medicine, advanced rehab, like working with athletes and and things of that nature. Uh, what I didn't really expect was that I was gonna be working with people that were in lots of pain and that I didn't have a whole lot to do for them. Um, and as I've, as I've practiced more and more, the understanding that the vast majority of people that I have come into my office don't have a diagnosable injury that they have to rehab. In fact, most of the, like we talked about in that first lecture, the number one reason people go to um, a physician is not because they have arthritis or because they have biceps tendon pain or they have elbow tendonitis or whatever, they go to the doctor because they hurt. And even though physical therapists, like I said, are good at diagnosing injuries with respect to what an MRI says, that doesn't encapsulate why somebody hurts. And whenever you can understand why somebody hurts, you can understand why you can intervene in certain ways that actually leads to better outcomes rather than just the straight like pharmacological approach where you just give them medications or you just uh, limit their activity. The um, level that we're going to be talking about here is just so you have kind of a rudimentary understanding of what some of these things are and just kind of know how the pain experience happens so that you know that whenever we get to kind of the capstone lecture as part of as my part of this seminar, which will be tomorrow whenever I teach you my, my kind of rehab protocol, um, you'll understand why, so, why we're doing those things because we're using those things to address pain, all right? <clears throat> so again, like it's to provide a rudimentary understanding of the pain experience. We're going to define it. We're going to talk about how it happens. We're going to talk about why humans feel pain differently than most other organisms. And it's because of these things called inner neurons. And then I'm going to ex uh, kind of give you a demonstration of why kind of the primitive brain, kind of the... Uh, the limbic system or kind of your primal like instinctual part of your brain, why that has like such a strong component to pain. And that's why people have such an emotional attachment or an emotional response to pain. Um, to tell you a little bit about the gate control theory of pain control, which is going to be useful to you guys as strength coaches, or if you're somebody who suffers from pain, you can high, you could very effectively use the gate control theory to manage your pain while you do things that you want to do. And and then um, we're going to talk about chronic pain, and we're going to talk about chronic pain because it was specifically asked by our own Brent Carter. All right, so if I were to ask somebody to define pain, this is probably not the this is probably not what you would come up with. A routine diagnosis or a routine definition of pain would probably be something hurts, or somebody might say like. Uh, sensory experience to tissue damage because that's what most people think pain is. If you go according to, and you don't, you don't have to write this definition down, all right? Uh, I'll kind of, as we go through here, don't like copy the slides. I'll just kind of tell you the things that I think are most important. A lot of this stuff is to just kind of keep me on keep me on track, all right? So I would maybe listen a bit more, and then if I think there's something to really pay attention to, um, I'll highlight it. Um, so the International Association for the Study of Pain has come up with a diagnosis of pain, which is kind of the universally accepted diagnosis right now. I don't think it's perfect, but it is better than a sensory experience because of tissue damage. The way that they define it is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage, all right? What this means is pain is not just a sensory experience. The, the feeling of pain is not just, ow, I poked myself, I feel the pain. There is multiple inputs that come into the pain experience. So you have nociception, which is just the just your body picking up on a sensation that is noxious or not pleasant. And then it starts a cascade that, that ends with an emotional um, response to that pain. It uh, causes aversion, it causes a withdrawal, it causes all these types of things. And then it can also um, you know, you see somebody who's really hurt, they've really injured themselves, how do they, how do they act? 
Or what do they look like? They kind of look like that dude from the picture on Santana's thing where he's just like leaned over and like holding on to his back. Like that is, that is not so much the sensory experience, that is the emotional and the behavioral response to that sensation of pain. And what's important here is that it talks about tissue damage as being actual or potential. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have caused damage to have pain. Even the body's interpretation that something is a threat, even if it doesn't damage pain can, or damage tissue can still cause pain, or it's a sensation that people will describe in terms that sound like tissue damage. People will say, like, it feels like someone is stabbing me in my ribs and ripping me apart. That's, that's probably not what's going on. There's no actual tissue damage unless you're in a Saw movie. There's none of that actually going on, but it's described in terms like that, all right? Pain is in, it's unbelievably complex. Does that make it worse when people describe it like that? Yes, 100%. 100%. That's called catastrophizing. Mm. It's, it's probably sharp pain, but describing it in terms that you would expect like somebody like ISIS to actually enact on somebody is probably not helpful. But there's an emotional and a behavioral response to it, so it, it kind of makes sense. All right, so the International Association for the Study of Pain, they have this kind of universally um, accepted um, diagnosis, but there's some things that they don't actually address with their definition that I think would make it more complete. Number one is that pain is a subject of perception. What somebody says is one out of 10 pain is totally different to what somebody else says is one out of 10 pain. 95% of the people that come into my clinic say that they are between eight and 10 out of 10 pain. For runner's knee pain and shoulder impingement syndrome, it's always between eight and 10. Walking the yeah, walking in the office, playing on their phone, <laughs> texting and stuff like that. But because pain, especially in the numeric pain rating scale, it is a subjective, it's a subjective, um, interpretation. It's not for me to say that, hey, you're not really in 10 out of 10 pain. It's whatever they think it is. All right. And so um, that's up to somebody's interpretation. And somebody who's, somebody who's been experienced with pain before or injuries before, like uh, think of like high school athletes that have played through injuries, they probably have a better pain tolerance. Now, it's interesting about pain tolerance because you'll, you'll hear everybody will say, well, I have a high pain tolerance. It's actually not the case. Whenever you look at studies that have been done on pain withdrawal, so they take a, they take a subject and they, um, they subject them to a noxious stimuli, so something that is, that's not supposed to feel good, everybody withdraws at about the same amount. So if you, you take like a, pressure, like a pressured filament and it's poking into the skin, at some point it's gonna poke hard enough that people are gonna withdraw away from that, right? Everybody withdraws at about the same level of intensity. So everybody's pain, um, uh, their uh, pain tolerance, their pain tolerance is about the same. The difference is some people have a higher emotional response or a higher behavioral response to pain. And so the people that deal with pain better have a muted or a kind of dampened emotional response. And that ties into behavior, right? So people have pain behaviors. People know individuals that act a certain way whenever they're, whenever they're hurt. There's some people that withdraw and they kind of adopt this thing called a sick role, um, like sick role behavior, with kind of like, woe is me, I'm never gonna be able to do, you know, they're like George Michaels, they're never gonna dance again because uh, they hurt themselves. And then you have some people that like, you know, for me, like people think that I'm fairly reckless because whenever, whenever I have an injury, like the first thing I do is I train, train like hell through it. But that's, that's actually an adopted pain behavior on my part. Um, individual beliefs and values, the way that you think about pain and your own values are going to change how you handle pain and how you how you exhibit that behavior because cultural values are actually really important. You can look across different cultures, across different cultures and across different genders in different cultures and see how individual genders, and we're talking about the two biological genders, right? Just let's just keep it there for right now. But you look at males and females in different cultures and there's, a, there's an expectation that they handle pain differently. It is 
actually quite rare to have, say, um, whenever I was in Hawaii, like we did have a, a higher number of like Japanese um, nationals. They were born in Japan, but then they had kind of immigrated over to Hawaii. And it is virtually unheard of in two years of practice me there for a Japanese woman to ever report that she was in any pain. I mean, people have like end stage osteoarthritis of their hip, they're limping, but they would not say that they were in any pain. They might say, oh, it's a little uncomfortable, but their individual cultural values, at least to what was explained to me, is that they're not, they're not expected to complain of pain. And so that, that really does play into this. And so um, here in the United States, we actually over accentuate pain to the point where a lot of people almost identify, they, they, they get their internal value from their diagnosis or from their pain. It's not, a, it's not uncommon for somebody to introduce themselves to you and they say, you know, hi, I'm Will, I have fibromyalgia. And it's like, well, I didn't ask you that, but you know, they're, they're and it, you know, we can, we can laugh about it and you know, to some, some degree it's kind of silly. It's almost like, how long does it take for, for you to know somebody does CrossFit? No time at all, because they're gonna tell you, right? But. Um, <laughs> What's important about this whenever it comes to pain is that's how powerful this experience is to people, that they, they almost start to identify with their diagnosis. Um, and then th um, the International Association of the Study of Pain does not cover psychological or emotional pain, right? Um, psychological and emotional pain does produce physical manifestations of pain, but it is not does not fit within the definition because there is no potential or actual tissue damage but the pain is very re real. All right, so why should we care? Does anybody want to answer that question? Why should individuals here, individuals here that are here because they want to kind of learn how to rehab themselves or how to work better through injuries or strength coaches that are here wanting to work with people, why do we care about this stuff? Yeah, absolutely. And maybe if we go a little bit more um, foundational than that, we know all we need to know from this guy. Anybody know who this guy is? Everybody hurts. This is Michael Stipes. Um, apparently he wants to hurt more because he's standing in the middle of a busy, <laughs> a busy uh, road. But yeah, everybody hurts. One, another thing about pain is pain is an absolutely almost universal experience. There's um, some like kind of case reports of some people that have an exceptionally blunted pain response, um, and they actually have a they have a very truncated life expectancy, right? But um, for the most part, for normal people, like pain is pain is a universal a universal experience. Everybody experiences pain to the to varying degrees. Um, and if you look at injury rate in weightlifting, it's actually one of the most, it's one of the, one of the safest activities that you can take part in. Um, it's, the injury rate for weightlifting is about the same as any other non-contact sport. And contact sports being things like uh, football, basketball, even baseball is considered a contact sport. Um, but, the injury rate is the injury rate is somewhere between 1.7 and 4 injuries per 1,000 participation hours or 1,000 training hours. So for a normal person that trains an hour, hour and a half a, a day for three days a week, you're looking at you're probably looking at one to two injuries every three years. And the way that they define injuries is kind of interesting because there's really no no way that people kind of universally. Um, universally do that. So whenever they do these studies, the, the, um, that injury rate is probably um, artificially high because of the different ways that some people, some studies, uh, that they define pain. So one of the big studies that they did, it was any, any pain during training was considered a training injury. So norm, nat naturally that's going to bump the numbers up. But then What's kind of been settled on is it's an injury if it keeps you out of participation for more than three days. So if we can, if we can distill it down to that, then we say about one to four injuries for every three years of training that will keep you out of training for three days. 
in that, we take away the things that, you know, your kind of minor tweaks and stuff like that that you train through and it's not that big of a, not that big of a deal. It doesn't cause you to lose training. But about every three years, you can expect to have an injury to two or three. They'll keep you out of training for a couple of days. All right, now chronic pain is a major, major health challenge, and it's a major health challenge across the entire world, um, even more so in the United States. Estimates are poor because, again, how do, you, how do you define chronic pain? But probably the lowest end estimates is about 11 to 15% of adults in the United States have chronic moderate to severe pain. That's one out of every eight people that walk into your gym. One out of every eight people that you see walking down the street has chronic moderate to severe pain. And whenever you, whenever you work in the healthcare field, it actually seems like about 90% of people have that. And I'm, and I'm, not, I'm actually not saying that to be cute. Like it, it is, it's pandemic, it's epidemic, it's, it, it's at such a higher rate in the medical field that it, it's, it would blow your mind to know the number of people that walk in that already demonstrate pain behavior of chronic persistent, moderate to severe pain. So for us, an understanding of the pain and the various inputs um, allows us to kind of get away from the biomedical approach to pain, whereas we think pain equals tissue damage. Because whenever you look at the literature as how do you most effectively treat chronic pain, see that honestly, like training is about the best thing that you can do for chronic pain. Way back when, so 1664, guy that some of you have taken high school math might, uh, might remember Rene Descartes. Rene Descartes, uh, outside of being a mathematician, um, he was also kind of a, we'll say an unlicensed, undocumented medical provider. Um, and anyways, he, he was kind of the first to at least illustrate what he thought was the pain pathway in the body. Kind of look at this guy who's for whatever reason, sticking his foot in the fire. Um, and kind of what, what Descartes thought was that you have these tubes, you have these tubes in the body that are full of fluid. And he, he knew that we sensed, we sensed pain and things in the head or in the brain. And what he thought was whenever you expose a part of the body to pain, that it tugged on this little, this little tube and it released fluid, and then that caused a change up here. So it released fluid that caused this to cause pain. Now, if we look at this, on the next slide, we're actually going to look at what the pain pathway actually is. Dude was not that far off. They're not, they're not fluid-filled tubes, but eh, he's actually kind of along along the same lines is what, what actually goes on. So there's a couple of things here and you don't, don't necessarily need to like write this stuff down, but you have uh, what's called nociceptors. Nociceptors are small uh, sensory organs in the body. They're there to pick up noxious stimuli. They're there to, whenever you step on attack or something like that, they are the first things that pick up that sensation. They carry information from that area to the spinal cord through what's called an afferent an afferent nerve. For us, most of the stuff is gonna be either A delta fibers or C, C fibers. Um, very sharp, well localized pain gets transmitted along A delta fibers. C fibers are the ones that kind of pick up dull, achy, nonspecific pain. Um, and there's, a, there's a, uh, a structural difference between those two and why they, why they conduct different, um, different sensations. So if you have prolonged activation of these uh, afferent fibers in the body, that causes an upregulation or a sensitization of the spinal cord. So whenever somebody's had a lot of input from an area that's painful or noxious, what happens is that actually sensitizes the spinal cord to become more sensitive to that type of input. And then you see where that starts to see where that starts to become a positive or a negative feedback loop, right? I'm in a lot of pain, so my spinal cord gets more sensitive to try to protect me from pain. It makes itself more sensitive, so more things start to become painful, which makes my spinal cord sensitize even more, right? And this is the beginnings of chronic pain. 